If you got your Bibles, say this is God's holy word, inspired by the Holy Spirit, the same inspiration that brought the word to us is upon me tonight to hear, upon Kubis to preach, my eyes will see, my ears will hear, my hearts will receive, and I'm going to get the glory. Right, let's, right, let's. Let's do Colossians 1.26 for a wake-up call, okay? This is not the sermon. It will be in the sermon, but this is the wake-up call. Colossians 1, verse 25, Paul says, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery... So Paul says, I'm a minister of a mystery. Even the mystery which had been hidden from ages and from generations. Okay, I don't know if anybody ever read it the way I just read it now. This mystery has been hidden from ages and from generations. So there are many generations that never got this ministry, this mystery. It was hidden from the generations. Not just, oh, from generation to generation. No, it was hidden for certain generations. This thing has been a hidden mystery. So they couldn't get it to be revealed to them. Hmm. But now it's made manifest to the saints. Verse 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery? So God wants us to know what is the riches of the glory of this mystery. Which is Christ in you? Comma. The hope of glory. Okay, so here comes the wake-up thing that will maybe be a shock to many people, but as the message go on tonight, it's going to help us. So this mystery, this mystery which has actually been a hidden thing from generations, which is Christ in you. Okay, so it's actually Christ in us, which has been hidden, which is so rich in glory, is only a hope of glory. So that is not manifested. But it is only a hope, which is a wish, which is future. Of course, but it's now been revealed. Uh -uh, uh -uh. He says, the, the riches of this glory, which is Christ in you, is revealed, which is a hope. Of glory. Okay? So what is revealed is Christ in us is so rich in glory. Christ in us is so rich in glory. That's revealed because nobody had Christ in them. Christ came upon them. Christ ministered through them. But Christ was never fully manifested in them. But that is only a hope of glory. So glory that must be manifested is not yet manifested. It's only a hope. What am I saying? You're going to see as we go on tonight. So chapter 6 of Hosea. Okay, maybe I will lose favor from some preachers, but if you listen, I'll get your favor back within 10 minutes. And it'll be so blessed that you will realize, man, this is good. Okay. Come and let us return. Okay, this is the message. Come, let us return to the Lord. For he has torn so that he may heal us. 
he has stricken so that he may bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. For those people who don't believe in revival, okay, God will revive us after two days. Quicken us and give us life, Amplified Bible. On the third day, He will raise us up so that we may live before Him. Verse 3, yes, let us know. Let us recognize and be acquainted with and understand Him. Let us be zealous to know the Lord. He's going forth, he's prepared and certain as the dawn, the King James would be said, he's prepared as the morning. And he will come to us as the heavy rain. As the latter rain that waters the earth. Verse 6, for I desired mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of the Lord more than burnt offerings. Now, that scripture, verse 6, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, is a futuristic thing in the times of Hosea, but it is fulfilled in a certain sense that in Matthew chapter 9, verse 13, I think, Jesus said to the Pharisees, I wish you would go and search out what it means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Then in Hebrews chapter 10, it says, uh, I desire not sacrifice, but I want mercy, therefore you have prepared a body for me. Okay, because it says sacrifice and burnt offerings you would not, but you have prepared for me a body. So the body of Jesus Christ uh, uh, finished this thing that God wanted, mercy and not sacrifice. So as from the, the sacrifice of Jesus, from that time, mercy is now available on the earth. So if we read backwards, if we take mercy, we can search to know the Lord. If we come to know the Lord, He will come to us like the morning sun. If He comes to us like the morning sun, which talks about light and glory, He will come to us like heavy rain, which talks about a supernatural revival. So after two days, He will revive us. And on the third day, we, he will raise us up so that we may live in his presence. Then he says, come, let us turn. Let us return. Let us come to know the Lord. Okay? I think the guy that read this maybe the most was Paul, and he quotes a lot from this. Because in Philippians chapter 3, the apostle Paul says, oh, that I may know him. He comes to say, you know, I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I'm born of the tribe of Benjamin. I, I, I excel any person in anything, in knowledge, in everything. He says, I'm so far ahead of all the Jews. I'm so far ahead of all religious people. He says, but when I think of all my advancement, it's a lot of dung. Afrikaans of I bitter klang. But it's a lot of dung. Hmm? You can make your own adjectives. He says, but if I think of all this stuff, there's one thing I want. I want to know him. And then he tries to explain what it is he wants to know about him. He says, I want to know something about the power of the resurrection. And he says, and this thing that I want to know about him, I have not attained it. He said, but Christ grabbed me for this one thing. Now I'm grabbing after him to see if I can get what he grabbed me for. Okay, so now I want to take that sentence and put it back into Colossians 1 verse 27. Okay, from Philippians chapter 3 verse 10 through 14. Paul says, if I can just know him, because he grabbed me for a specific thing. Now I'm grabbing to him to get that thing that he grabbed me for, but I have not attained it. Okay. So Colossians 1, 27, he says, I want you to know the riches of the glory, which is a mystery that's been hidden from generations, which is Christ in you, which is the hope of glory. So I want to put the two together and make a statement and an assumption and see if we can qualify it tonight. Paul says, there's a glory which now is just a hope. That is the thing that God has grabbed me for. Now I'm going to grab towards God so that I may know that glory which is now just a hope. He says, but I have not attained to it. But I'm going to keep on grabbing to it because that's the thing that I really want. Okay. So glory is a hope. 
But in the story of the, the, the glory and the hope, we read in Hosea that he says, uh, let us come to know the Lord. Let us really return and come to know him. He will come to us like the morning sun. He will come to us like heavy rain. He will come to us. So he says, God will bring a revival. Okay? When will he bring the revival? After two days. Amen. So on the third day, <laughs> so that we can live before him. Okay, everybody says, revival will come after two days. So that on the third day, we will live in his presence. Now, okay. Whenever God said to the children of Israel, I'm going to come down and I will descend on the mountain. But Moses first had to ascend on the mountain and the cloud had to cover the mountain. And God says, my glory will appear. Okay? So God's presence and God's glory are working together. If the glory is there, the presence is there. If the presence is there, the glory is there. God's presence is all over. Okay? But His manifested presence is not all over. So God's glory is not all over. But the day will come when it will be all over. Because God gave a promise in Numbers chapter 14, verse 21, as sure as I live, says God, my glory shall fill all the earth. Okay? Now, God is swearing by himself, like he says in Hebrews chapter 6. And 7. He says, as sure as I live, do you think God is alive? Now, God says, as sure as I live, my glory shall fill all the earth. Now, I know there's preachers that love to preach about the calamity that will fill all the earth and catastrophe that will fill all the earth. And I think the end time preachers had a lot of sermons now with Bush and uh, Israel. And uh, they have a lot of sermons now with this great earthquake in China. So I just want to say it's got nothing to do with Bible prophecies. Okay, the earthquakes in China and the Bush, Ali Bush alliance with uh, 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 Israel has got nothing to do with Bible prophecies. Okay, God is not interested in seeing how this earth will going down. God is interested in seeing how He can fill this earth with His glory. So uh, don't say anything ugly or switch your TV off or run away before you've heard the message. How many remember what 2 Peter 3 verse 8 says? You're supposed to know it by now. Huh? 2 Peter 3 verse 8. Okay, 2 Peter 3 verse 8 says, I will draw a timetable here. 2 Peter 3 verse 8. Maybe I should just stick to the one day and not the, all the rest. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 8 says, As we know that one day with the Lord is the same as thousand years. And thousand years with the Lord is but one day. Is that all right? So uh, if somebody else from another religion come to you and say they don't believe in Jesus, ask them, why do you believe in the year 2008? Because the calendar starts, and before that, it's B.C., in all religions, in other words, before Christ. I don't care if they're Islam or they Hindus or they Buddhists, they all believe BC, before Christ, and they all believe AD, anti domini after Christ, okay? So no matter what religion, every time they write out a check, they say, we believe Jesus came. Thank you. So since Jesus... 1,000 years, 
2,000 years. No, how do I write now? Okay. Ach, lieber Vater, help me for not. Are you with me? Up to one, to two, okay. The year one. That's one day. That's two day. That's the third day. Okay. So we are more or less there. So we have just entered the third day. So he will come to us like the morning sun. He will come to us like the dawn. So the sun for the third day has just risen. It's just coming up. Two days have passed since the birth of Christ. So on the third day, after two days, he will bring us revival. So that on this third day, we can live in his presence, which is his glory. I thought maybe we can look at that and maybe think, well, maybe God has a plan for us. So this next millennium doesn't bring calamity, doesn't bring destruction of the ages. It doesn't bring Israel back to God. It doesn't do anything like that. It's going to bring in a worldwide supernatural Holy Ghost revival. This millennium is going to usher in the very presence, the tangible, visible, seeable, touchable glory of God. And we got to know how, and we got to understand the timetable of God. And if we understand that, we've got a purpose in praying and going for this revival. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 2 tonight. Hebrews chapter 2. Forgive me if I'm still in the air. <laughs> Eighteen and a half hours flight. Thank you, my father. I cannot do that. That will take too much. Okay, I made a statement. I said, uh, glory of Colossians chapter 1 verse 27 is a hope. It's not a manifested reality. The riches of glory Christ in us is manifested. We all know Christ is in us, and that makes us new creations. But the glory that needs to be visibly seen upon the face of the earth is only a hope. And then I took uh, Philippians chapter 3, combined it with uh, Hosea chapter 6, combined it with Colossians chapter 1. says, the thing that Paul says, I want to grab it because that's what I grab for. But Paul says, I have not grabbed it, but I want to know him because of this. He's talking about the glory of the Almighty God. Mm -hmm. So, uh, mm, mm, mm. let's see how spiritual the crowd is. Jesus, I'm, I, did, I think I did say it two weeks ago. Jesus didn't come to take anything back from the devil that Adam lost. I want to repeat that because that's a doctrine that the church has got that has led us on a sidetrack that is not a true track. Jesus didn't come to take anything back from Satan that Adam lost. I want to repeat that because I can hear, you know, everybody's ears are now open for the first time in the service. Okay. <laughs> Jesus didn't come to take anything back from Satan that Adam lost. That is the main teaching of all the nominations. Jesus came and he took back from Satan what Adam lost. What a poor gospel. What a terrible, poor situation for the almighty God to become a man, to come and fight Satan to get back what a man lost. I mean, that's a poor gospel. Sorry if I shock your religion. But Jesus didn't come to fight Satan, to take back what Adam lost. Jesus came to bring a total new thing to this earth. Okay? So the glory, I want to make a statement. Glory is not something that Jesus took back. Je glory is something totally new that Jesus brought. Hmm? 
So just stay with me during this meeting. Jesus didn't come to bring us back what Adam lost. Jesus came to bring us a total new thing. He talks about new wine, a new garment. He talks about a new testament. He talks about a new name. He talks about a new life. He talks about a new creature. He talks about a new heaven. He talks about a new earth. Jesus came to bring an altogether new thing. So I want to say, make a statement or two. Adam was not clothed with the glory like we used to believe. Adam didn't lose the glory like we used to believe. And Jesus didn't come to take back the glory that Adam lost. We've preached it. I have preached it. There's many sermons where I've preached it. I had to repent a couple of weeks ago when God challenged me in my prayer time and said, where does it say Adam had glory? Where does it say Adam lost the glory? You've been preaching it because everybody's been preaching it through the ages. But the Bible does not say Adam had glory. Neither does the Bible say Adam lost the glory. It only said because of Adam's, Adam's offense, sin entered the world. But it doesn't say anything about anything that Adam lost. Nothing in this Bible said he lost anything. The only thing he lost was his life. By eating from the wrong tree, the only thing he got was death. He didn't lose anything. He was the same man he was before. He never lost glory because he didn't add glory. Okay, for the people who struggle now, can I throw a scripture in? Because this will be tomorrow's message. I don't want to speak too much on it tonight. But in in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says, The first man, Adam, was a natural man. And he was of the earth earthy. The first, listen to this. This is tomorrow, so I don't want to elaborate. The first man, Adam, was of the earth earthy. He was a natural man. He was a living soul. Not a spiritual being. He was a soul man. Lived by emotions. Okay? Then he says in the Amplified... This man was made out of dust. The first man was made out of dust. The first man was made out of dust. Now here's the shock. You and I are not made out of dust. You were born. It may sound stupid till you get the revelation. You were not made out of dust. You were born of a woman. And this is going to change our doctrines so much in the next few weeks. The second man was the Lord from heaven. And that which is spiritual was not first, but that which is natural. Adam was not a spiritual creature. He was a natural man. The Bible says it in 1 Corinthians 15. But we are not natural. We are spiritual. Because we are born again. We are first born, then born again. So you are not dust. And apart from that, on top of that, you got the born again experience by the wind, breath of God. So you're doubly spiritual. Okay, that's tomorrow. So let's just go back to today. Hmm? You want that one tonight? No, I've got another one for tonight. Hmm? Is that okay? Can I help you? Let's read Hebrews 1, then we'll understand a little bit more. Verse 2 says, in these last days, God has spoken to us in the person of a son, whom he appointed heir and lawful owner of all things, also by and through whom he created the worlds and the reaches of space and the ages of time. Verse 3, he is, are you ready? You all ready? Verse 3. Verse 3. You can hear the oohs and the ahs. Somebody's reading. 
Somebody's jumping ahead of me and reading it by themselves. Have you got verse 3? He is be healed tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus. Be free. Okay? He is the soul. Jesus Christ is the soul expression of the glory of God. Thank you. God spoke to us in these last days by the Son. He is the soul expression of the glory of God. He is the light being. He is the outraying of radiance of the divine. And He is the perfect imprint and the very image of God's nature. So Adam was it not? So Adam was it not? Or was not it? <laughs> if Jesus is the sole expression of the glory, if Jesus is the perfect imprint of the image of God, then Adam was not. Adam was made out of dust, a natural man. Okay, what about the image of God? What about Adam in the image? Oh, no, this is the stuff that I used to preach. Oh, man, and I, I love to preach it. So God woke me up a few weeks ago and said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Genesis chapter 1 was my desire for man to make him in my image and my likeness. But chapter 2, I had to form him from the dust to bring forth a natural man. So that I can produce the second man that will be in my image. Because the first man didn't add the glory. He was a natural man. But God wants to fill the earth with his glory, so he had to bring forth a second creation man. All right. Is it too much for... Too, huh? Huh? Tomorrow. Okay. Verse 5. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son? Okay, there goes another doctrine. Angels are not sons. We know the story of Genesis, you know, in that big, thick book, God's plan for man, which people think, whoa, this awesome revelation of the sons of God, you know, uh, marrying this, the, the sons of men, which is the angels marrying with God people and then uh, giants were born angels have no sex the bible says so it's not a curse word was it okay a angels cannot marry human beings and bring forth giants okay so the doctrine is when the sons of God came to the sons of men, it's when angels mixed with human beings. Hey, this book says, God never said to an angel, you are my son. Yes. We just have one moment of quiet. Thank you. For all the holy cows that have just been screaming at the abattoir. Hmm? Am I saying too much in the introduction of the service? We believe so much stuff that makes such good messages, but it's not truth. So that's why we've never been totally free because it's knowledge of truth that sets us free. Not knowledge of religion, but you know, we've been preaching stuff without checking it out. And I just had to think lately, maybe I should check a few things out. Wake up and you know, I love the word. I'm a good student of the word, I believe. You know? One of my heroes, which is also on our channel in the mornings, which is one of the greatest preachers in the world, said three weeks ago, well, when we look at the word, you know, and it says, and, and Isaac sojourned in the land. The word sojourn in the Hebrew means, you know, go and take it. It's all yours. 
And I went and I looked in the Hebrew dictionary. It says sojourn means you're a stranger and nothing belongs to you. <laughs> and this guy built a whole sermon on sojourn means go take the land. It's yours. Uh, you take... And, it's, and, and everybody, yes, yes, because his name is, you know. And because everybody respects him, nobody checks him out. So I just took the dictionary and said, you're wrong. And then he quoted another Hebrew word, and he was more wrong. And then he made a third statement, and I made the statement in church, and God said, did you check that one out? So I went back, and I checked the Strong's Concordance, and he was wrong in all his exegesis of the Bible. I said, Lord, God says, people come at a place that they don't think they don't have to check it out. So when God started speaking to me about the natural man and the spiritual man and the glory and the hope of the, I had to start checking it out and I was shocked to see how much stuff I preached through the years that are not truth. But because everybody believes it, it's good. And God said, Adam never lost glory because he never had glory. Jesus was the first man that had glory because he was the sole expression of the glory. I said, yes. He says, yes. John 1, 14, the word became flesh and dwelt amongst, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Hmm? Yeah, that's where the teaching comes from when they realized they were naked, and the teaching says because they were clothed with the glory. And the teaching comes from Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory. It doesn't say all have sinned and lost the glory. It says all have sinned and they short the glory. In other words, when we get the glory, we will not be sinners. Okay, it doesn't say we lost the glory. It says we short the glory. Thank you. You can check it out. It's there in your book called your Bible. Let's read verse 5. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son? In other words, God never said to an angel, you're a son. They are servants. Ministering spirits, verse 14. Verse 6, moreover, when he brings the firstborn son again into the habitable world. Habitable, where people stays. He says, let all the angels of God worship him. Referring to the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds and his ministering servants flames of fire. Now remember, when Jesus was in the wilderness and tempted of Satan for 40 days, the Bible says, and after 40 days was ended, angels came and ministered to him. Remember, angels came and ministered to him. Remember how Jesus in the garden gets said, uh, I said, can, I can now call and a legion of angels will just come and help me. You know? So angels were there all the time to minister unto him. Okay? Verse 10. No, let's just do... Verse 13, besides to which of the angels he ever said, sit at my right hand and uh, till I make your enemies a stool for your foot. Are not all the angels ministering spirits sent out in the servants of God of those who shall inherit salvation? Verse 5, for it was not to angels that God subjected the habitable world of the future of which we are speaking. Okay, listen to this. When God brought his firstborn into the habitable world, angels had to come and minister to him. And he was the soul, he was then the sole expression of the glory of the Father. He says, but he never spoke to angels and said, you are my son, but he said, they are just ministering spirits. He says, now, there's another world that we are talking about. It's also habitable. So he's not talking about heaven. He's talking about the world that is habitable of the future. Is it a different world? Is it another world? Or is he just trying to bring our attention? Now we're going to look at that. He says this habitable world of the future which we speak. Angels are not going to be the rulers there either. Huh? Okay, if you don't understand, don't worry. We're just going to read on slowly and you'll get it. It has been solemnly and earnestly said in a certain place, What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man 
that you graciously and helpfully care for and visit and look after him. For some little time you have ranked him lower than and inferior to the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the work of your hands. For you have put everything in subjection under his feet. Listen and stick with me. This habitable world of the future that we talk about is not subject to angels. But it is said, what is man? That you are mindful of him. Now listen, verse 8. For you have put everything in subjection under his feet. Man, normal man, is supposed to be the ruler of the world of the future. And everything is supposed to be under his feet. He's supposed to be. Now, in putting everything in subjection to man, he left nothing outside of man's control. Are you ready? Are you really ready? But at present, we do not yet see all things subjected to man. Okay. Let's go back to where we started. Let's take it maybe a little bit slower that I don't go too fast. Hmm? Paul says, the mystery that's been hidden from generations. So they could not see it previously. It's so rich in glory, which is Christ is now in us. He says, great. But you know, all that mystery that's now manifested is only a hope of something else that must still come, and that is the glory. Okay? So glory is a hope of something that must still come. <laughs> if we have no hope, why do we go on? Without hope, you are lost. The righteous shall live by faith, but hope is the substance of faith. You out hope, you can't have faith. So if we have no hope for something more to come, why do we live? Why don't we all die and go to heaven? So there's a habitable world of the future that man must take control of where everything will be under man's subjection. So God says there's hope for humanity right here on this earth. The hope is the glory will yet come. And <laughs> so back up. He says, uh, after two days, he's going to revive us. Then he will come to us like the morning sun. He will come to us like the rain. On the third day, he will raise us up. The glory talks about the presence of God. I don't have to go into the dedication of the temple, Moses on the mountain, and all that stuff. He says, but God says in Numbers 14, 21, as sure as I live. In other words, God takes his own life to swear by it that the glory will still fill all the earth. Now comes Peter in 2 Peter 3, 8. He says, we must not forget that one day for God is a thousand years. A thousand years for God is one day. So he says, you've got to understand this, otherwise you'll never understand God's timetable. So since Jesus came, we had B.C. Okay, 70 B.C., you know, and 80 B.C., and 460 B.C. Then we have 80 Okay, for a thousand years, we had a lot of stuff happen. For another thousand years, a lot of stuff happened. And when 2000 came, woo, the end time preachers had their sermons. The computers are going to bomb out. Airplanes are going to fall. Nothing's going to work out. All information will be lost on the computers. There's going to be chaos. That means it's a rapture. So when the church goes away, everything will be chaos on earth. Ooh, and everybody's going to die. You wicked, selfish thing. Rapture people are the most selfish preacher on the face of the earth. You can hear how I've been attacked now. Rapture preachers are the most selfish people on the face of the earth. Because they don't care about the whole world. They just care about themselves running away. But people that believe in the kingdom believe this world must be saved. And we don't wish destruction. We wish salvation. Thank you, I will. <laughs> it's the most selfish preaching that you can find. So after two days, he's not going to rapture us. He's going to revive us. And on the third day, in other words, after we experience revival... 
His presence are going to come. In other words, if we really promote revivals right now, and if we try to have revival all over, what's the next thing on the agenda? Glory! The manifested presence, smoke clouds filling the churches, man. So there's a habitable world of the future. He says, uh, everything is subject to man. He says, but at present, we do not see it. Okay? Can I help you? He says, I don't know how far we can go. I must write, I must write, I must write. If Adam lost it, the wordings would have been different. He says, the world is subject to man. This is God's idea in Genesis 1, 26, 7, and 8. My desire for man is to be in my image and to have total authority over the works of my hands. This is my idea for man. Hmm? But Jesus was the first one to come forth in that image. Otherwise, Hebrews is a lying book. Because he says he was the sole expression of the image of God. He was the sole expression of the glory of God. He didn't come and took it back. He came with a sole expression. He was the only one that had it. He says, but if we look at this, here comes God's desire. What is man? That you are still mindful of him. That you still say everything is subjected to him. He says, and in talking about everything, he left nothing outside of man's control. Just look a little bit more interesting. Okay. He left nothing outside of man's control. He says, yet at present, we do not yet see it. In other words, from Genesis to now, we don't see it. So it has not yet been manifested in normal man. The next verse says, but we do see Jesus. Who came and did this. And he showed us it can happen. He could speak to the storm and say, peace. He could speak to the winds and say, be still. He could speak to Lazarus and say, come forth. Uh, okay, he could wake up and, you know, he could walk on water. He, you know, he was in charge. You know, anything, if you passed a funeral procession, he would just touch the coffin and the guy jumps up. You know, I mean, Jesus is, you know, this is how it's supposed to work, but I can only show it to you for three and a half years and I got to go. So from ages, something has been hidden. It's that this one that now walked here can now stay in here. And now that he's in here, that is the hope that you can have the glory in which he manifested. So the habitable world of the future will see people doing what Jesus did. And greater works than these because I go to my Father. Huh? So what happens when Jesus goes to the Father? He says, uh, come boys, let's pray. I'm going. Father, I pray that the glory that you have given me I now give to them. But in actual fact, if you go read through John 17, he says, but actually not so much to them, but to those that will be in the future believers in the word which they have preached. So they are partakers of it, but not manifestors of it. But there will come a generation that will not be just partakers, but manifestors. So, Father, the glory that you've given me, I have now given them. I pray that you give them the glory. You know, three times in John chapter 17, I hope you 
going to be with me. So, 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 so do I need to explain or do you see a little? I mean, we'll go on tomorrow, so don't worry too much if you don't see it today. Okay? But we are able to see Jesus. The best is coming. Was made a little lower than the angels for a little while, crowned with glory and honor. Who was crowned with glory and honor? Jesus. Okay? But this scripture is quoted from Psalm 8 that says, What is man that you are mindful of him? You have crowned him with glory and honor. But Hebrews says, We don't see him crowned with glory, but we see Jesus crowned with glory and honor. So Adam didn't add it. Thank you. I just uh, trust that you are running with me. And because of his having suffered death, now this is where you've got to get it. In order that by the grace of God, he might experience death for every individual person. Maybe next week. For it was an act worthy of God and fitting to the divine nature. It was an act worthy of God. Just listen. And fitting to the divine nature. Now remember 2 Peter 1 says, because of these promises we can be products of the divine nature. That he, for whose sake and by whom all things have their existence, in bringing many sons into glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect. Through suffering. Okay, nobody heard that one, so I thought it, it, it could be heard, but we didn't hear it, so... Uh, what did you hear? Hmm? Oh, Lord. This will be too much for one night. Maybe I should just keep that one. Hmm? You don't know what I'm talking about, man. <laughs> How can you say, don't, 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 mm. Shaba. Abba, Jaba. Maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't. Just look this way. Maybe tomorrow we're going to touch a little bit more on the seventh day, but tonight we're here busy with on the third day. Let's just throw this one in, okay? Jesus did his miracles 99% on the seventh day. But there's only one recorded miracle on the third day. Are you? And Jesus says two things. He says, on the third day, there was a wedding. And Jesus turned the water into wine. Okay? So uh, you can understand when he talks about the Holy Spirit and the new wine. Fresh oil and new wine. Okay? Just listen to this. Here it says, I also love to speak to Jesus. Jesus said, go tell that fox. You know, I will do miracles today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I shall be perfected. Okay? The same John 2 where he talks about the wedding, Jesus came with his disciples and they passed by the temple. And the disciples says, look at, look at the, look at this. You know, look at these bricks, man. Look at the stones. Look at the building. Jesus said, break the thing down. And on the third day, I will raise it up. Okay. So after two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we will live in his presence. On the third day, says Jesus, I will be perfected. On the third day, water will be turned into wine. So let's just see if you get it now. Verse 10. Is it? For it was an act worthy and fitting for the divine nature that he for whose sake and by whom all things have their existence in bringing many sons into glory should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect 
through sufferings. Okay? What is a pioneer? It's the one that gets there first. You're supposed to see something. The pioneer is the one that gets there first. Okay, so we had in this area pioneer shaft. It was the first gold mine in the area. Pioneer shaft. Okay? Somebody breaks through and go visit. Oh, there's some, something falling out of my Bible. Okay, so uh, somebody goes and breaks through the bushes and, you know, finds a place that nobody ever has been. And he comes back into civilization and said, I found a place. And they say, dude, that guy is a pioneer. Okay? You break through in anything first, you call a pioneer. So Jesus is our pioneer of what? What salvation? He talks about bringing many sons into glory. What was Jesus? He was the express soul image of the glory. So he was the pioneer. He was the first one to manifest the glory. He was the first one to be crowned with glory. He was the first one that had the glory. He was the first one that could rule the universe. So he was the pioneer and he was perfected on the third day. How? By suffering. So uh, Jesus was crucified. And on the third day, he came out of the tomb. To bring us something, he said, I suffered to bring you the glory. Remember when the Greeks wanted to see Jesus? Jesus said, uh uh, no, I must first go into the ground and die. If I come out, I'll have many sons. Okay? Many sons of what? Sons of light. Sons of glory. Right? Is it all right? Let's just find this place to sit. How far do you want to go tonight? Verse 11. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So if he's the pioneer, if he's the firstborn, and we are brothers, and he wanted to take many sons into glory, then we have a hope of getting the exact same package. Hmm? Not a minor package, not a lesser package, not an inferior package. The very one in whom Jesus was wrapped up can now be our package so we can come forth in the very glory. And they, oh Christ, no, it's You feel bad? Put your name in there, sucker. Okay, yo, we are heading. Glory is now just a hope. I hope you see what I'm trying to stress here. We have a hope. Not heaven. Heaven is not a hope. You just die and you go there. And everybody there has got everything. No, they haven't. They haven't got bodies. They must still come back to get their bodies back. So the Bible says when Jesus comes, we will bring them so that they can get their bodies back. So they haven't got everything. Hmm? Huh? They haven't got Coca-Cola. <laughs> forgive us, forgive us. Some people will now take it bad. Bless you. Just go to heaven. Okay. What I'm trying to say is, God has got a plan for this world of ours. And His plan for this world is not destruction. His plan for this world is sons of glory that will... Have dominion. Hmm. Why do you think the whole world is in chaos with elections right now? And there's no real leaders coming to the front. God is shaking this whole thing to see the church coming to the front. And when spiritual leaders start arising, you're going to see this world coming into order. And you see, things started taking shape, and we will not have to worry about weapons of mass destruction. We will see Christians taking authority and stretch out there, bringing peace to nations. Oh, no, no, no. When they say peace, peace, then no sudden destruction comes upon them. That was fulfilled in 70 AD with the burning down of Jerusalem. God says, I know 
my thoughts for you is peace and a perfect future. I think this is better than that other stuff. Hmm? How far must I go? <laughs> huh? Tomorrow. Hmm? Romans 5. Romans 5. Romans 5. Romans 5. And don't read. Look up. For you're going to read, you're going to run ahead of me, and you're going to shout before it's time. Just look up, don't read. <laughs> don't read. Look here. Here when I clap my lungs, you say, don't read. Okay, so. <laughs> two, two or what weeks ago, I ministered on 1 Timothy 3.16. And I prophesied in Easter, I said, creation is waiting for the second manifestation of 1 Timothy 3.16. 1 Timothy 3.16 says the following. Great is the mystery of godliness. Amen. Now we know that we just read about the perfection and the divine nature there in Hebrews chapter 1 and 2. But Second Peter chapter 1 says, you know, God has given us this great and precious promises whereby we can become partakers of the divine nature. Promises. If you think of promises, the first thing that jumps up is Abraham. And God gave these promises unto Abraham and unto his seed, not saying seeds as unto many, but seed as one, which is Christ. But if we belong to Christ, then are we Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So if we really believe what we're preaching, we become so one with Christ that we are joint heirs with Christ. So that's why Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter 1, I pray that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened, that you may know Know what? What is your inheritance? Hmm? Yeah. So, uh, this will be too tough to speak on tonight, but I can just throw it in because otherwise you will not understand the next scripture. Romans 6, we died with him. <laughs> Ephesians 2, we raised with him. Yeah. Ephesians 1, we are blessed with him. Ephesians 2, we are seated with him. <laughs> co-death, co-raised, co-seated, so co-suffered. So do I have to suffer? Do I have to be crucified? Do I have to go three days to the grave? Okay. Just keep it in mind. So 1 Timothy 3, 16, okay, just take your elbow, feel it, is it sharp? Yeah. Hit the guy next to you and say, wake up. <laughs> <laughs> Not WWF, stop it. <laughs> okay, listen, listen, don't read. Callum, listen, 1 Timothy 3, 16. Great is the mystery. Now we know we spoke in Colossians 1, 26 and 27, the mystery that's been hidden from generations. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. Scene of angels. In other words, Jesus himself said, no man has ever seen God, but only him to whom the Son desired to reveal him. 
But yet, if you've seen me, Philip, you've seen the Father, says Jesus in John 14. Okay? But no man has ever seen God. Because John 4, God is spirit. 1 Timothy 1, 17, unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible. Unto the only wise God be glory. So God is invisible. Yet Jesus made the invisible God visible. Yes. Hebrews chapter 1. He is the sole expression of the glory of God, the exact image, imprint of the image of the Father. Okay? So Jesus, if you see me, I can see cookie drinker funny papa. Okay? So, <laughs> someone forgive me. I am the image. I am the perfect imprint. I am the stamp. I am he. But I am here to show you this is actually my desire for you. So what I am doing is not for me. It's actually for you. I didn't come to take back. I didn't come to rob Satan. I didn't come to get something from Satan. I came to bring you something totally new. Which is glory. Which is just a hope. So one day... On the, after two days, he will revive us so that on the third day, we can live in his presence. Is that all right? So when Jesus was born, Matthew chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, and he was born, man, the angels flipped. They started singing. Joy to the world that Christ has come. And the Bible says when they started singing it, myriads of angels joined them. M-Y-R-A-I-D-S, myriads. In other words, trillions of billions of angels joined them in singing. Hosanna, the king is born. Glory to God in the highest. Why? They saw God for the first time. When they looked at the... Ah! The wise men said, we saw a star. Balaam prophesied, I see a star. But not now. A star is born. Okay? So when I look at the stars... What is man? So if he was the pioneer. Okay. Okay, so uh, let's just do, let's just do, let's just do Romans 5. I'm doing Amplified. Okay, let's just do Amplified. King James. <laughs> Therefore, wherefore, therefore, 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 wherefore, therefore. Okay, are you here? Since we are justified, acquitted, declared righteous, and given a right thing, we are through faith. Let us grasp the fact that we have the peace of reconciliation to hold and to enjoy peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. Through Him also we have our access, our entrance, our introduction by faith into this grace, state of God's favor in which we firmly and safely stand. Let us rejoice and exalt. Yes. before I did. <laughs> Can I read it? Yes. For those who have no Bibles, listen, sir. Listen. Let us rejoice and exalt. You know what exalt is? The U, not the A. It's just, you know, when, you know, whoo -hoo you know, you, you know. Let us rejoice and exalt in our hope. Of experiencing and enjoying the glory of God. 
I got to read it again. Let us rejoice and let us exalt in our hope of experiencing and enjoying the glory of God. I hope we have more amenors now than in the beginning. So uh, he says, hold fast to this hope that one of these days we're going to experience And we're going to enjoy the glory of God. So uh, it couldn't happen before because the third day hasn't arrived. But eight years ago, we stepped into day three. So we are just in the morning, so the sun is just about to come up. Light has shined, but the sun is not yet seen. But he will come to us on the third day like the morning sun. And when that sun comes up and life is restored and we are revived, bam, revival rains will fall. And before we know, woo, glory. First Peter chapter 5. You know, I haven't even started what I want to preach on. How are we not going to be able to get there tonight? I don't think so. Where are we now? We are in church. Okay. So, good. First Peter. Okay, just look here. Just to put a little bit of emphasis on the hope, on the fact of John 17, the prayer of the glory, on Paul that says, I grab for it because I was grabbed for it, but I have not yet got it. Okay, the fact that the disciples of 2,000 years ago couldn't get it. Okay, they, they were partakers on the inside, but the manifestation wasn't for them. Corbus, how can you say that? They had much, no, they were prophets. Okay, let's read. King James. Amplified. King James. Amplified. Read both. The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Did you got it? Chapter 1. Did you see, Peter says, we are partakers of the glory, but we are not partakers of the revealing of the glory. So we have the mystery that's been hidden from generations which is Christ in us, which is very rich in glory. But the manifestation of the glory shall be revealed. Peter Paul, Hosea, what are you saying? Did you see every one of the scriptures that we touched on tonight talks about the sufferings and the glory, sufferings and the glory, sufferings and the glory, okay? We just got to put that in, okay? For those who do not know, you can get these messages. I've preached this for about 18 years already. So it's not something totally new except the fact of the seventh day thing and uh, that Adam lost thing. Did you think Jesus died so that everybody in the world can suffer? Or do you think Jesus died so that everybody in the world can make it for a change? So wake up, man. Don't listen to the trash of those. And if we look at Israel bringing prophecy into fulfillment now with our own president now standing up for Israel. I wonder how much they paid him. Okay. First Peter 1. Verse 10. 1 Peter 1, verse 10. It's just Bible. I haven't said anything what I didn't quote from the Sunday Times. I didn't quote from the Time magazine. I didn't quote CNN, BBC, Russia Today, Al Jazeera. I didn't quote. I just read Bible. 
I just I didn't quote the Palestinian bombings and the Israeli war and the, you know, and the suicide bombers and the, you know, I didn't quote one of them. That's political trash. That's not Bible prophecy. Huh? Sorry. We'll have a moment of silence. Right, verse 10. Are you in verse 10? Yes. The prophets who prophesied of the grace <laughs> which was intended for you search for and inquire earnestly about the salvation. Okay, let's do it in English. <laughs> The prophets, are you here? Yes. Who prophesied? Who prophesied of the grace which was intended for you, searched and inquired earnestly about this salvation. They sought to find out to whom or when this was to come. King James, they were searching. Or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which in them did signify? Which time the Spirit was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glory? Okay. That's only 5%. Read verse 12 for the other 95%. It was then disclosed to them that the services they were rendering were not meant for themselves and their period of time, but for you. Who's the you? It is these very things which have now already been made known plainly to you. Now remember for chapter 5, what I just read. By those who preach the good news to you by the same Holy Spirit. Into those things, angels long to look. This is holy water. Listen. Let it rain. Open the floodgates of Ice Age. <laughs> Sorry. Forgive us. I didn't mean to go that direction. I don't. Are you ready for the word? Yes. First Timothy 1, 1 Timothy 3, 16. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, seen of angels, taken up in glory. Yes. Hebrews 1. It was an act worthy of God to bring that pioneer into perfection he had to suffer to bring many sons to glory. Hmm? So it is written, what is man, that you are mindful of him. So the habitable world of the future is subject to man, and nothing is left outside of man's control. But we don't see it at present. But we are able to see Jesus who could do it. So there's a time that this hope will be manifested that we will be able to do it. He says, so prophets prophesied, and Peter said, even we are writing to you about the sufferings and the glory that must follow. But we all wonder, which time will it happen? He says, so it'll be happening to people upon who the end of that time will come. Angels desire. 
to see it again. So if you have an IQ above 43, you'll be able to understand. Angels are waiting to sing again. Joy to the world that Christ has come. Angels are standing at attention saying, we'd love to serve humanity. We'd love to just look into when we can see God again in flesh. When can we see God in flesh? When we're going to... So since we have all these great and precious promises, 2 Peter 1, whereby we can become partakers of the divine nature, let us change our minds. 2 Peter 1, 1 Peter 1 verse 13, so be sober-minded. Philippians 4, 8, so finally, brethren, whatsoever, think. Romans chapter 12, 1, change your mind. Ephesians 4, 23, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Start thinking, my goodness, I have hope. The hope is I'm going to get the glory. And when I'm going to get the glory, bam, bidi, bam, wham. Where's my Bible and my glasses? Is it mine? This? My glasses? Thank you. Inside, thank you. Or all my advisors, just see me in my office afterwards, please. Thank you. Um, let's do Romans 8. I think I need to stop. What's the time? It's only nine. For you, it's nine. For me, it's already 11 now. I'm actually seven hours ahead of you. Sure, I'm, I'm five past four in the morning now. Mm, no wonder I feel what I feel like. Five past four. <laughs> you must know I just arrived from Korea, so it's five past four in the morning. Uh, the only thing I wanted you to see tonight is this hope thing. Okay? So we'll do two more scriptures for your sake. Huh? No, for my sake. For your sake, I'm going to do about 20 more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's do verse 15. Got some beautiful horn. Whoever gave me and sent me this horn, thank you. It's a beautiful horn. I don't know if I can blow it. I'll try. <laughs> okay. I'll try later. My lips are, f my lips are full of anti-wrinkle cream. Okay. <laughs> 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 For lack of having anything to say. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's not true. You don't put it on your lips, man. Verse 15. <laughs> it all looks so beautiful, you don't need it. So I will not spit on you. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. Forgive us. If you're religious... We forgive you. Okay. <laughs> Verse 15. I just want you to get this one truth here tonight. <laughs> if you're religious, we've got people that sell all sorts of cream. <laughs> What's this called? Crow feet. What? I don't know. I don't know. Verse 15. For the spirit which you have now received is not a spirit of slavery to put you once more in bondage to fear. Now you should read Hebrews 2 with that to understand the whole story. But you have received the spirit of adoption, the spirit producing sonship, in the bliss of which we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit 
thus testifies together with our own spirit, assuring us that we are children of God. And if we are his children, then we are his heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, sharing his inheritance with him. Only we must share his suffering if we are to share his glory. Okay, how many say to share the glory? But what of that? For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth being compared with the glory that is about to be revealed to us and in us and for us and conferred on us. Okay, if you've been quiet all night, would you just now say, wow. <laughs> Our church has a great influence in the world revivals. Bam, you can see it. Okay. <laughs> Bless them. <laughs> mm. For even the whole creation waits expectantly and longs earnestly for God's sons to be made known, waits for the revealing of their sonship. Did you see that this hope, glory, manifested, powerful, sonship, ruling, author thing is something that was from Jesus' days till now, futuristic. But did you see that as we entered the third day, it's like, hey, hey, maybe God will do nothing save he first reveals it to his servants, the prophets. Maybe now people are starting to, hey, if one day is a thousand years, thousand years, one day, then we have just stepped into day three, the sun is just about coming up, then it means, hey! We, not time to fly away, Popo, time to take over. There's a difference between flying away and taking over. The habitable world is supposed to be taken over by the church. It's not to be left Behind by the church. Amen. You selfish thing. You want to run away and leave the world for the devil? You're supposed to cast him out. He's not supposed to drive you away. Your earth. Hey, it's your earth. Verse 6, let's just close, because a few people are waiting for the trumpet to blow. <laughs> for God, who commanded the light, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, as shot, 2 Corinthians 4, 6, 2 Corinthians 4, 6, I did say it. What did I say? <laughs> what did I? Ronnie says I did say it. <laughs> Didn't I say we're going to Second Corinthians? Okay. Would you forgive me? Set me free. In nomine Padre, it's very Spiritus Santos. Right. Thank you. For God. I mean, by reading the scripture, you're supposed to know it's 2 Corinthians 4, 6. My goodness. Hebrews 5 says, because of the time, you're all supposed to be teachers. Now you're supposed to suck milk bottles. Okay. For God who said, let light. This is our last scripture. We are closing. 
this part of the message. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts so as to beam forth the light for the illumination of the knowledge of the majesty and the glory of God. As is manifested in the person and is revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. However, however, we possess this precious treasure in vessels of earth. Okay? So it says, God shone in our hearts to bring the glory. However, we possess it as a treasure. A treasure has to be hunted and found and brought to the light. Hmm? Okay. Hmm. Verse 10. We are always carrying in the body the liability and exposure to the same putting to death the Lord Jesus suffered so that the resurrection life of Jesus might be shown forth by our bodies. For we who live are constantly being handed over to death for Jesus' sake so that the resurrection life of Jesus may be evidenced through our flesh which is liable to death. Hmm? Verse 13, yet we have the same spirit of faith as ye had who wrote, I have believed and therefore have I spoken. We too believe and therefore we speak. Tomorrow we're going to touch on that. Assured that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will raise us up with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. Verse 16, therefore we do not become discouraged and utterly spiritless. I mean spiritless. Exhausted and wearied through fear. Though our outer man is decaying and wasting away, yet our inner man is renewed day by day. Verse 17. For our light affliction, momentary affliction, the slight distress of the passing hour. Keep, keep your finger there and go back to Romans 8. Yeah, 8. Eight. Romans eight. Verse eighteen. I consider that the sufferings of this present age, this present time, are not worth being compared with the glory that is about to be revealed. I don't know how many times I must preach this before we get it. You know what we are going through now. No, he says, uh, 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 it can't co compare to the glory. Yeah. So as long as you are with stuff, all stuff preachers listen to me for a change. As long as you are busy with what is happening to you, why you're suffering, what you are going through, you are hindering the glory. <coughs> and the glory can only come after the revival, so you're stopping the revival. So you shouldn't, oh, you let me just stop. Okay, let's go to 2 Corinthians 4 before I lose your attention and your favor. 2 Corinthians 4. For our light momentarily affliction, the slight distress of the passing hour, is ever more and more abundantly preparing and producing and achieving for us an everlasting weight of glory beyond all measure, excessively surpassing all comparisons, all calculation, a vast and transcendent glory and blessedness never to cease. Everybody stop there, look up and don't read on. Say, whoo-hoo! <laughs> oh, brother, we all have stuff. And then the whole church, yes, amen. <laughs> amen. <laughs> if I start talking about the trash we're going through, the whole church, yes. Oh, and later I tell you the demons are out. Yes. And everybody can associate. That is trash preaching. Sorry if I'm the only one that differs, but I think that's trash preaching. 
Jesus didn't come to preach stuff. He came to preach good news. He came to bring victory and conquering power. Brothers and sisters, we all go through stuff. Amen. Amen. But here it says, all this momentary stuff that we are going through, you know, is actually preparing us for more glory, and this stuff can't be compared. So the stuff is there. So the acknowledgement of the stuff is there. It depends on if you read the whole thing. If you read the next verse, bam, bidi, bam, bam. No, not bam, bidi, bam. They crash the wall or whatever. I'm glad to announce on TV, I'm original. I'm not a cookie drinker. Okay. I'm not a copycat of nobody. Okay. Yeah, I'm original. What I am, I am. I don't copy no one. Okay, listen. For our light momentary affliction works for us that glory. Verse 18. King James, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Amplified, since we consider and look not to the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are visible are temporal, but the things that are invisible are deathless and everlasting. Amen. Clubbers, amen. 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 Oh, enough for one night. Okay? So as long as our attention is on our situation, we are stopping the glory and hindering the revivals. But the minute we start looking away and say, oh, glory. Oh, man, the glory is just around the corner, man. It's hanging over the roof. It's knocking at my door. I can smell it. <laughs> oh, man, I can feel it. Woo! Man, woo! every time I breathe, I get the goosebumps all over me, you know. What, what do you want? Do you want glory or stuff? Hmm? Do you want revival or trouble? So make a decision. Make up your mind. Change your mind and go for revival. Speak revival. Talk revival. Pray revival. Sing revival. You know, spread revival. Go for the good stuff. Go for power, signs, wonders, miracles. You know, don't look like, you know, you're the next one they're going to carry out. Like when this guy died in church, you know the story. And, the, you know, the preacher said, would you just go phone the guys to come get this guy? He died in church. So the funeral people stopped, the undertaker stopped, and they were running around, running around the preacher. And at last they said, say, which one? Okay, so. <laughs> we we want to be of the live ones, okay. Let's, hmm? Hmm? Amen. I don't know if I said anything tonight. Or if you heard anything tonight. But we have a hope. The hope is glory is going to be our portion. If you run away, you're not going to get it. You're going to watch from heaven's and you're going to check us getting it. And you're going to say, why didn't I stay here? Okay. Hmm. I can prove it to you scripture upon scripture. God is going to show his glory in us, through us, on us, amongst us, through us, over us, upon us. We are the carriers of glory on the inside. We have this treasure. It's time to let it come out in supernatural Holy Ghost torrents of power. We are the cause of the most greatest revival that's going to hit the earth of all times in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's stand.